Yeah, so um, are are we good to go? We're good to go. All right. Well, hello, everyone that I don't know. Um, fantastic to make your uh, uh, visual acquaintance <laughs> and uh, hopefully voice wise later. So um, as Rhonda mentioned, I'm Brian and uh, I am here to talk to you about a composer, a dissertation and a tenure track job that worked walked into a bar. And honestly, I wish that I had some like clever ending to that as a joke, but honestly, sometimes just like all of it feels like a joke. So that's why I framed it that way. Um, essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through, uh, show, talk to you about Lee Highland. Just out of curiosity, which of you do know who Lee Highland is or have heard his music? Okay, awesome, sweet. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to be listening to some of that, uh, including I did a, a concert uh, in New York at the Stone at John Zorn's venue of all Lee Hyla music and played in all of the pieces. And so I'm going to start out by recommending that you never do that ever uh, because <laughs> your fingers will fall off uh, uh, literally. So uh, that was fun. But anyway, going to be uh, showing you some clips from that to talk about his music um, some of what I found in his archive uh, in Chicago and, and some work I've done there, and then how that influenced my dissertation, which eventually got me to this, uh, uh, to a tenure track job in Miami that began in January. Um, so needless to say, it's been a really weird first semester. Uh, and uh, happy to, uh, to talk about what that has been like as a new faculty member. Um, Okay, so let me get this screen shared. Oh, dearest host, would you allow me to to share my screen? I will, I will, I will, I will. I'm making you a host, but where are oh, you? All right, thank you. Sorry, sorry, dude. No, no, it's okay. It's a big day. I finally have made it to host status. Maybe. <laughs> Try that. See if that works. Ah, fantastic. All right. <laughs> so let me get this going. Okay. So here we go. Um, at any time, um, feel free to just like hop on your mic and say something. Please interrupt me. Um, for what that matters. So here we go. Um, to start off, um, uh, Lee Hyla is a composer that I actually learned about at the farm. Um, I was in the kitchen, for those of you who have been there, and uh, David looked me squarely in the eye and said, you haven't heard Dream of Innocent the uh, Third. And I sort of looked back and was like, no. And he said, do it. And so I did, and it was amazing. And it was the first of many, uh, many of, of Lee's pieces that I, um, that I listened to. Um, Judy and David and Rhonda have, have played a lot of his music. Um, Rhonda knew him very well. Um, uh, do bug her, ask her for her recordings because they're amazing. Um, and so here are some, some pictures from the archive to just start it off and kind of talk about him briefly. Um, I was surprised to find one of him playing the cello. Um, as to my knowledge, he did not play the cello, but uh, this, I guess, proves otherwise. Uh, he was a pianist and um, had some really interesting uh, non-classical influences that I'll get into. So um, just a, a few of these. Lee Hyla, just in case you, you want to see his name there. Um, and so his archive is in Chicago, uh, maintained by his widow, and she let me come a few times and um, stay on their couch uh, before she moved and, and be in his studio and kind of absorb uh, from his space. So uh, I want to share a little bit of this Dream of Innocent III, just in case you haven't heard it. This is uh, the first time that I played it. Um, in New York and uh, emphasis on the massive percussion that you see there. Uh, little fun fact, those rototoms are actually the originals uh, that they were written for. So just in case you haven't heard it, uh, here's about a minute and a half of the beginning of this piece. Oh, actually, 
I don't know if I shared the computer sound. So excuse me while I have a Zoom moment. Um, I, I was so planned out. It's OK, Brian. It really <laughs> is. It's, it's so annoying that you have to even do. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's OK. All right, now, now this should, let's see. It's just like the story of my life with, I'm, with everyone, I'm sure. Um, OK, so if you can't hear, let me know. But um, here we go. So just to kind of give you a sense of that, um, do check out Rhonda's recordings, one with Judy uh, playing piano, which is marvelous, and uh, another one with Lee actually playing the piano as well. Um, and this was super fun because that first drum kick scared the um, everything out of the audience because she played it, w and me, because she played it way louder than she ever had in rehearsal. It was great. Um, so uh, Lee Hyla. Um, he was a composer. Uh, he lived in Boston and New York and Chicago. He headed composition departments at New England Conservatory and at Northwestern. Um, fabulously influential person that more people need to know about. So uh, my underlying goal for this is that you will play his music. So um, subliminally, if you hear that, uh, then it's working. Uh, he played piano. He played in um, uh, he, he played in punk bands. He he played when he was younger. Here are some photos of him playing keyboard uh, with a one of his groups in middle school uh, or high school. I think this was uh, middle school one. And they would play at school functions. And so from a very early age, he was getting into a, a kind of music that was not classical. And that had uh, far reaching implications. Uh, the other thing about him that I just have to mention is baseball. Um, huge, huge baseball fan. And I just love that his childhood team was the Sox and his adult team became the Red Sox. Um, I never got to meet him, uh, which is something that I am so sad about, but it's been amazing to get to know all of these stories and talk to a ton of people um, who knew him. Um, so, uh, it, and this is a photo that, that I think really uh, shows, if you don't know him, gives the beginning of a window into who he is. My two favorite markings that I'm, I've come across in his music, sardonic and rocking, and sempre con funk, all right? Uh, uh, very much typical of, of these different influences. Um, I also found this picture in his archive, and I don't know where it came from. He was an extremely devout Catholic and uh, Catholicism had a big influence on his compositional processes and his life in general. And uh, I found this in, in the midst of uh, a stack of photos with him and, and a group of nuns, um, which I haven't yet personally found out um, the story behind that, but I just thought that that was a, a great blending of uh, uh, disparate parts of his life. Okay, so his influences, all right. We have on the left, um, Captain Beefheart, 
which is possibly the strangest, um, most mind-altering music I've ever listened to. Um, Danny Felsenfeld is a composer who worked with, with Lee and said, if you want to know his music, listen to Captain Beefheart. Um, the album is, is uh, painful to get through on the first time. It's grating. Uh, but by like the sixth or seventh time through, it, it's genius. <laughs> there's, there's some weird thing that, that this uh, Captain Beefheart did. Um, he's the one on the, um, on the far upper right, by the way. And then in the center, we have Neil Young. He had a poster in his studio that said, what would Neil do? Um, a very important influence there. Um, he actually was invited on a tour with Crosby, Stills and Nash, which Young later uh, joined. So there was also an, an interesting um, uh, link there. But he decided to go the composition route instead of going the uh, uh, the, the rock and roll pianist um, only route. And then Cecil Taylor below that, a uh, fantastic jazz pianist. And then on the right, James Brown, um, whose picture is the biggest because, uh, uh, to give you some context, his piano um, was, was undisturbed when I, when I saw it. And behind all of the music was a poster that came with a James Brown record. Um, big, big fan of James Brown. I'm going to play a little bit of you, uh, play a little bit of a piece for you. Um, Mother Popcorn Revisited, a piano trio that, um, as far as I found, hasn't been recorded. And Mother Popcorn is a James Brown song. So uh, speaking of popcorn, here is uh, an example of James Brown, just in case you're not familiar. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pair some of these influences with excerpts of his music uh, that I have found to be captivating to show. Um, it's not that he was like recreating rock and jazz. It's just that he had so deeply absorbed that music and it was such a part of him that it manifested in in these kind of unconscious, well, not kind of, but totally unconscious ways, I would argue. Um, so here's an example of James Brown. <laughs> funk. It was all about that funk. James Brown's been called the king of funk. And uh, I have paired that with an excerpt of We Speak Etruscan, which is just incredible. I, I don't know, every piece is incredible, but um, I'm a little biased because like, I've spent years of my life studying his music uh, entirely. So um, here's an excerpt. This is for baritone, sax, and uh, bass clarinet. <laughs> goes on like something very very different um as as is usually the case okay so the next uh, i want to show you uh, this this rocking idea so here's a bit of neil young which i'll pair with uh, a bit of dream of innocent the third so here's rocking in the free world All right, and then to go along with that, uh, and this is actually a picture of um, the fresco that inspired the piece, uh, DOI 3 for short, Dream of Innocent the Third. And uh, Pope Innocent is uh, having a dream, uh, Pope Innocent's the one sleeping there on the right, uh, that St. Francis is literally holding up the Catholic Church. And this had such uh, a deep effect on him that uh, it inspired um, this piece. So uh, this is part of a rocking section from that uh, with Rhonda playing cello. And I, I think this is the recording with Lee playing piano. <laughs> So again, just to kind of give you an overview, and, and 
last but not least, uh, Captain Beefheart. When <laughs> this is from the the first track on the album, um, so buckle your horses. Uh, and it, in addition to this, uh, you know, real groove and and the way that that influenced his sense of time, there's also this um, uh, very dis rhythmically disparate kind of sounding sections and the way that he juxtaposes those and uses time as an expressive element, I find really captivating. So um, this is uh, uh, some Captain Beefheart for you. <laughs> Go back to your land of gloom Where black jagged shadows Remind me of the coming of your doom It's so good. <laughs> All right, and then um, pairing that with a little bit of the uh, his fourth string quartet played by the Lydians. <laughs> So those are some sections that I see as as showing that there is a connection there. Not necessarily, again, that he was trying to recreate uh, uh, this this non-classical music. Um, he also was uh, a, a huge fan of Beethoven, very influenced by Carter. Um, uh, you, you know, he, he had those classical influences as well. But what makes him unique is how much he had absorbed these. So I want to show you two more pieces. Uh, that are totally playable by you, and you should do it, just in case it's not clear enough that I think you should play these pieces. This is the, uh, the second half of his duo for violin and cello, Amore Scaruto, and um, it, it brings in some of these elements. I'll, I'll be curious to hear, uh, after the next one, I'll be curious to hear some, some reactions of, uh, about this music, but... Um, uh, yes, and the, the violinist is uh, Michiko Turer, who is uh, out in California, but um, here we go. So just to, to give you a sense there, um, he loved harmonics because he had a great cellist to show him how harmonics worked. And, uh, and when I say that, I mean Rhonda, by the way. Uh, and I, I can prove this because I actually did find a tape in his archives um, of Rhonda showing him harmonics. And uh, it really used, he, he used them so masterfully. They, it, and it always lies so well on the cello. Um, so, uh, and that piece actually, um, David gave me the score for, I don't know if you remember that David, but, um, so yes, I, yes, I do. And Edward has just asked for it. So I'm actually looking for it and who knows by the time we're done, I might even have it up on the Google drive. Oh, and I also have my iPad here and can upload the score if, uh, if we need, well, you're, you're busy, Brian. So I thought I would do it, but uh, just <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, thanks. Oh, right, presentation, right. Not just talking into the void. No, I'm kidding. Um, Zoom problems. So this is, uh, he has two piano trios. One is Amnesia Redux, which um, I think there's an excerpt of it later that uh, Triple Helix um, has a recording of. This was written for the Gramercy trio, I believe. And as to my knowledge, has not been recorded. Uh, 
really fun piece. Um, I like it because it has moments of really showcasing each instrument. And uh, I, I found that, that this pianist, Robert Flights in New York, is um, uh, did a great job getting this. Um, something about Lee's music is he, he played himself with a very earthy kind of strength. And, and his tone is, I don't know, strong is, is how I feel it. And always so grounded. I find his music so visceral and his piano playing was the same way. So here's a little excerpt and the, the violinist is Paul Howard in the Milwaukee Symphony. Um, so here's some, somewhere in the middle of Mother Popcorn Revisited. <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know, I, I really enjoy that piece as well. And again, totally needs to be played. Um, those two are now published. Um, in, in the past uh, year or so, they, um, they finally got those out. Um, there are 67 pieces in his catalog. The majority are chamber music, 28 are still unpublished. Um, and we're actually working on getting them published. Uh, there's a contract for some more um, soon. But uh, uh, yeah, so I heard this music and was just like, uh, and I loved it, but I had no idea how to understand what was going on. Um, some of it sounded random, but it felt right. So I, um, my, my goal was to figure out what that was. Do y'all have any thoughts or um, questions at this point or, or anything you want to jump in about? And if not, that's okay. Just, you know. Cool. Okay. Well, um, so uh, his music. Now, one of the cool things about his uh, uh, archive and the work that I got to do there. This is what I saw. This was his piano. Um, you can see in the upper right corner of, uh, on the stand on the piano, there's a James, so you can even see James Brown a little bit. Um, and he, uh, I, I hear he always had that back there on that piano. You can also see on the right side, uh, there's a tape recorder on that corner of the piano, right? And what he would do is he would record himself improvising, working out different sections of a piece, and he'd record it on um, a good old fashioned tape. And then uh, uh, it, he would make notes about it. So here uh, is a, a sheet of, of notes, um, which I think this is the amnesia redux one it says at the top but i have the little thing that says like share screen so i can't see the top anymore but um it says doi3 at the top actually oh it does wow i'm yeah. really killing it um cool no, <laughs> so yeah so this is from one of his tapes where he was working out doi3 and the numbers on the left side the 000, 000 024 uh, that corresponds to the counter on the tape recorder uh, just in case you don't happen to have a lot of experience with like analog tape recording. Um, and so he would listen through and make these notes. Um, and uh, there are, I mean, 
boxes and boxes of these notes and tapes and all of this. Um, so he would do this. Sometimes he would then play that tape in another tape player and record himself on top of that. So this double taping idea. So um, this we have for Amnesia Redux. I, this page does correspond to the tape, but I didn't want to like actually use his tape player just in case you know I screwed it up or something. So I don't actually have the exact section that this page corresponds to, but I'll play a little bit of this double taping thing. And I, I also just want to show you about like a fourth of the way down, right? We have like the ditto marks and then piano chords and then Cecil-like version. That's Cecil Taylor, right? I was mentioning earlier. So um, this was very much, you know, uh, just to show you some of the ways that he, he absorbed this. So here's um, uh, a little bit of, of this. And, you know, I, I thought a lot about this of should I play this? Because he didn't intend for anyone to hear this, right? This is his own uh, uh, creative process and creative ideas. Um, so for instance, um, this is not something that I would like put out on the internet, right? Um, but I think it's valuable to to hear the qualities that he was using and, and the way that he was playing the music. So here's just an example of what that double taping is like. So he was being very specific, uh, but the way that like, um, you know, when you would like feeling a groove, right? Uh, feeling a groove, it is, isn't necessarily here is a metronome, right? I'm going to play there. There's some push and pull of this rhythm, especially in funk, right? You might have hear people say play on the back of the beat or be a little more forward on the beat. So he took that quality and actually notated the exact specific rhythms of everything. So it looks like very complicated music but it's really just putting down these very natural gestures. So I want to, uh, so he would do this, this taping thing. Uh, then he would write out a sketch. Uh, this is an unidentified sketch. So I don't actually know what piece it is from. Um, but, and, and again, just pages and pages of these. And he all, he kept everything uh, and kept them all together and ordered, um, except for some that were, were out. So, um, you know, it, it looks, I don't know. I think it looks kind of messy, uh, but uh, this was his thought process. Then he went from here directly to a full handwritten score. Uh, beautifully written full scores. And he would do them all by hand. And now music notation, right, shows this. And all of the different subdivisions, you can see subdivision, different subdivisions all over here. And he, he would plan it out, right, by hand in the score. Um, and I think there's, there's just something really wonderful about the care that he would put into that notation. So um, I actually have a, a few different steps from the tapes to show things that he was doing to work up to this. Um, I think the first one, He's playing piano with one hand and playing melodica to get the cello line. Um, I think maybe that's the second one, but here's like some of him. <laughs> This is DOI three. Um, okay, so here is uh, uh, another section of tape. So you know he's working out this this piano texture, and he's working out what the cello line is going to be. He's singing along with it. And, and everything he wrote was so vocal. 
um, it, it was, uh, uh, there, no matter the weirdness of the rhythms or whatever, everything was so vocal because he was always singing with himself. Um, I th can't remember if there's one more of him or if this is the recording of the actual piece. One more of him. the actual notated piece is and it's uh, essentially this page of score So what's what's really neat about him, and for anyone who's looking for something to study in grad school, uh, I highly recommend that you take a look into him and his music. Um, I mean, just boxes and boxes on tons of shelves of this sort of material, and we can really piece together how it went from uh, how he went from nothing to final score of a of published and printed. So I think that there's a lot about the creative process that I think is really valuable um, that we can learn from his work. All right, so um, questions, comments? <laughs> All right. Blown away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. I the the music it it's just phenomenal. Um, uh, good so I'm glad so um, that's uh, I, I heard his music I was searching for a topic for my dissertation I did a PhD not a DMA uh, at NYU it was crazy I'm have I will happily talk to anyone who's curious about that um, lots and lots of studying and um, non playing things so what I did for my dissertation the full title of which is a linguistic approach to rhythm and meter analysis of temporal structure and phrasing in the music of Lee Hyla. <sighs> just tiring to even say that especially I finished it like a year ago so you know there's still a lot there um, but uh, uh, what I wanted to do was find a way to analyze and explain how his music made sense to me and uh, formally speaking it's it's pretty straightforward um, and I, I don't know straightforward might seem like a bad word but um, it's not too labyrinthine to to make an understanding of it but for instance in these sections where there wasn't an, a steady beat right the time signature changed every single measure what was I to do? I wanted to play this music in concert. Um, and so I wanted my dissertation to be something that I could develop. I'm a major nerd in case that's not clear yet. I'll own up to that. Um, and so I wanted it to be something, you know, highfalutin and, and, and theoretical that I could also use in this final performance. Uh, so I developed this, this system, um, which I'll get into, but it all starts from perception. So I'm very interested in, in how our perception changes and between people and how does that change what we do and our choices, all of that sort of thing. So in, in terms of music and talking about analyzing music and you know, this is not original, this is from other people. Um, this is a visual analogy, right? Circles and squares. Okay, yeah, those are two different things. We're gonna visually group those into circles and squares easy enough. Uh, that is accentuated by the fact that there's space, right? So in, uh, it, they could also be circles and squares together. Okay, still, I know where the circles are. I know where the squares are. If I am making groups, it's pretty easy to put things together, right? Well, we get in trouble uh, when 
let's say there's more than one way that we could be grouping this, right? Uh, circles and squares, or do we go with black and gray? Um, okay, well, there's a space there, right? Okay, so maybe this one's really about the circles and the squares, whereas maybe the second, the third one is really about the black and gray. So there's so many little details, and this is just a simple visual analog. Of course, in music, we have register, timbre, dynamic, um, it, the list just goes on and on of these different details and different things that will put parts of music together. And in classical music, we have, um, you know, a, a beat, right? 4-4. Four, four. We're pretty much going to expect, okay, one is stronger, three is the next strongest, and then two or four are not as strong. Uh, which presents a lot of problems. What do you even mean by strong, right? And um, and and it gets into, a, well, I, I won't, that, that's a whole nother talk that I won't go into because you will definitely be asleep by the end of that. Uh, so I, I, I was curious, how how are we perceiving this music? How am I perceiving this music? Because if I can figure the way that I'm perceiving it, then as a performer, I can control that. And I can phrase in a way that's gonna match someone's perception, right? If we play Beethoven, we emphasize beat two and four repeatedly, something's just not gonna sound, it's just not gonna feel right, you know? Um, so what are those structures like in music like Lee's? So I started with, with this idea of perception and uh, I thought about speech and it sounded very much to me like the rhythms were speaking. So uh, I went to language and I looked at how is rhythm described in language? Because we have all of this baggage about pitch and harmony and ugh, chords and all of that, right? That get in the way of what's the rhythm really doing? So in speech, we classify languages in a few different ways. Um, uh, syllable timed versus stress timed. So for instance, in English, each of my syllables is a different length, right? Uh, there's a lot of different rhythms here. In, um, and, and generally languages are classified as one of these two. Um, some other ones that are stress timed, like English, um, are German, uh, I think Turkish and maybe Russian. Then we have syllable timed and syllable timed languages. Generally, each syllable is about the same. Spanish is an example. Um, uh, actually, many of the like Italian and and French. So what some researchers did is they looked at the rhythmic variability between different languages. So English, very very, uh, very varied rhythms, high rhythmic variability. In uh, French, I believe they used syllable time. So each syllable is about the same length, low rhythmic variability. Oh, that is not this slide yet. Cool. So, um, <laughs> wow, I was not expecting that right here. Um, so I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some graphs in a second, but um, in English, all right, to get at this kind of speech-like rhythm thing. Um, I took an excerpt of an interview that Ira Glass gave because he is a well-spoken individual and it was an unplanned answer just to get some like normal speech. And I just, it felt really awkward trying to record myself for an example like this. Uh, so I didn't do that. Also, Ira Glass is great and This American Life is awesome. But anyway, um, here's his, uh, this excerpt of this interview. I have like a bunch of favorites. We've been doing this show for so long. You know, just think about like, if you're cooking meals in a restaurant for 20 years, like it's hard to name the like, there was that one meal, like pretty, you hope you're doing like a lot of really good meals. All right. And then if we take away the words and we take away everything except the rhythm, this is what the rhythm only sounds like. I will tell you, it's impossible to clap a beat with it. I've tried many a time. All right. Uh, to 
give an example. Here's uh, part of Amnesia Redux, this um, uh, piano trio. And here's a part of the piece, which is uh, uh, mostly in unison. <laughs> triple helix all right and now here's that same excerpt but only the rhythms and i want you to see how similar it is to to the speech rhythm so to me i found a similarity in that so I thought, uh, if I go to language and see how they talk about rhythm, then maybe that's something that could help us in music. And um, here are the graphs. Yay. OK. So this is uh, a, a fancy looking thing. But basically, NPVI is a measurement to uh, uh, look at rhythmic variability. So the thing for English speech is higher than the thing for sprint French speech. What this means is that there's more rhythmic variability, right? Then what these people did is they took music by English speaking composers and by French speaking composers from the, uh, I believe it was the 19th century. And they took pieces that were not purposefully stylistic, so no waltzes, for instance, that didn't include words, so nothing with song, just instrumental music. And they analyzed the rhythms in the themes. And what they found, boom, supposed to add some drama. It's the same for music. There's more rhythmic variability in music by English speakers than in music by French speakers. So it, which I find just really interesting, it's been replicated uh, by people who used, I think, 12 different languages and something like a thousand different themes. I don't know, um, lots of things to be analyzing. But uh, there is some subconscious link there between language and music. And, you know, I, I don't know about y'all, but I've had so many people say, oh, well, um, you know, music is a language right uh which I, I won't go too far into this because it's controversial but i would argue that music is not like a language or sorry music is not a language it functions like a language but um and we have people like leonard bernstein in the 60s uh did these lectures about language and music and some interesting ideas but he tries to kind of force these linguistic concepts onto music music doesn't have words and we can talk about chords and everything but there's not semantic value to chords. So anyway, I won't go off on that. But um, so I like to say music is like a language. <laughs> um, so stress theory. All right. This is how they talk about rhythm in English. This was uh, developed in 1977 and furthered in 1995. The version that I'm using is by Bruce Hayes, just in case you like thoroughness in, in research. And uh, he gives this example of, of this sentence. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, would anyone be willing to read this dramatically? Oh, yes. yes. Most definitely. <laughs> may, I, may I proceed? Oh, please. I, I, this is making my week. And then anyone else can go. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Belgian farmers grow turnips. Fantastic, fantastic. All it's right. okay if it wasn't. Can... <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was great. Um, would anyone else like to read it and emphasize different words? I can try. All right. Belgian farmers grow turnips. Fantastic, awesome. So, right, with language, we can, oh, yeah, Scott, you want to? Belgian farmers grow turnips. Great. Okay, so y'all are getting the idea here, right? We can emphasize different things depending on the context. So, what stress theory does, though, because let's say that we're talking about farmers in Europe, 
right? Then we'd say Belgian farmers. Or let's say we're talking about crops that, gar that Belgian farmers grow, right? Belgian farmers grow turnips, right? And um, by the way, emphasize, right? Oh, what were y'all doing to emphasize words physically? Because we use this word like, oh, give more emphasis to that note or phrase to that note. But like in language, physically, what were y'all doing? We're emphasizing the important part of the sentence. Great. And, and physically, like, like, how were you doing it? We're making it louder. louder. All right, louder. Uh huh. Any any other thoughts? With, uh... We we physically move our body, but also we change how we you know like if you're bringing out Belgian, you might articulate the beginning more. So you know there there are the the clear like louder, softer, but also more or less articulation to bring out in which yeah music language. Also the intonation. If you emphasize Belgian, that's going to be higher. Whatever word we're emphasizing going to be higher by the week. Great. Y'all are y'all are hitting on all the things. Absolutely. And in stress theory, they actually point to three specifically. Um, pitch contour being the most strong indicator of emphasis. Uh, duration being the second most. So if I say Belgian farmers grow turnips, that duration uh, will emphasize. And actually studies have shown that pitch is something that, or sorry, uh, loudness, dynamics, is something we think um, emphasizes things, but in terms of perception, it's actually not that strong of an indicator. It isn't, it will signal emphasis, but not super strongly. Um, so what stress theory does is it looks at this idea of emphasis and it finds a normative way of talking about it. So let's say we had no context for this sentence right? What uh, stress theory is going to do is it's going to pick out which syllables are strongest based on parts of speech. And this is what it looks like. So the X's are the emphasized syllables and it's a hierarchy. So as you go up when and syllables that have more X's have the most emphasis. So Belgian farmers grow turnips would supposedly be the the normative way of doing it. And here's the, the sentence structure um, in case it doesn't make you cringe too much from um, your previous educational experiences. Um, and so this is what stress theory does. So I thought, well, I, I believe that I'm perceiving these rhythms in the same way that I'm perceiving the rhythm of language. So uh, another example, let's take the sentence up. Uh, uh, dogs chase cats, right? Dogs chase cats, generally evenly spaced when we say it naturally. We can add in all sorts of other words, but those are still going to remain, like the dogs are chasing the cats. Rhythmically, we're still aligning the sentence around those three important words. So how does this work in music is what I was going for. And, and I wrote a lot of things about it, but <laughs> Some uh, other people have talked about this sort of thing before. Lairdal and Jackendoff are two uh, theorists and composers who, uh, well, actually, um, uh, Fred Lairdal is a theorist and composer. Ray Jackendoff is actually a linguist and randomly a clarinetist. Um, he teaches at Tufts, but he's retired now. But um, anyway, they collaborated and made this generative theory of tonal music based on Noam Chomsky's generative linguistic theories. If your eyes are glazing over, don't worry. The, that's, that's the end of the fancy words. Um, but uh, uh, they took these ideas and um, essentially what generative systems are, are systems where there's a set of rules and then you can sort of plug things in and it'll kind of come out in the same sort of rules. So sentence structure is a set of rules that will then generate uh, ways, ways that we speak. So uh, I thought of uh, applying this theory, this generative theory of tonal music, to Lee Hyla's music. And it has two aspects to it. Um, this is the excerpt that I'm dealing with. This is uh, DOI 3. Uh, let me just play it real quick. <laughs> I 
don't know what the question marks and boxes are. They randomly appeared when I imported it into Keynote. So um, just disregard those. <laughs> but you can see the rhythms, um, you know, time signatures changing every measure. The rhythms are a mix of sixteenths, eighths, five tuplets, triplet, you know, always changing their ties over the beat. All sorts of things that, that can complicate the rhythms here. So uh, their theory was made to apply to tonal music. And so I tried applying it to this just to see what would happen. And the answer is there's a lot of problems. So this is their grouping structure. And essentially what grouping structure is, is it's a hierarchy. All of this is a hierarchy, meaning that there are small parts within larger parts within larger parts. And the brackets are what I found to be um, the different groups based on their rules. Um, so this, I, I tweak it for my own theory, but um, uh, this was my attempt at it with this. Grouping structure generally works. There are groups around uh, after rests, before big register changes. Um, the bigger the, the, the change in register, like in the first line, there's that low C um, where the, you get the little overlapping thing, just a quirk of the theory, but um, there's a fermata. There's a huge register change. Um, it has a marked accentuate, like lots of things to suggest that it's a big grouping boundary. Um, so uh, that's why it's grouped all the way up the hierarchy. So this is what grouping structure looks like in their theory. Their metrical structure really needs an even meter. And this is where it's like, one is the strongest and then three, that sort of thing. Um, and it doesn't work here. All the little dots below are an attempt to get, and you can see the first measure of four, four, right? Three dots, one dot, two dot, one dot. Then it should be the same pattern, three, one, two, one. But things change because the time signature changes. And basically this just does nothing to describe the music. So I can draw it on there and that's fine, but it has nothing to do with what we're hearing and it doesn't help me as a performer. So how could I tweak it? Boom, prominence theory. That's what I am calling it. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm extending that um, uh, generative theory of tonal music, GTTM, extending that with the linguistic theory that talks about uh, perception and emphasis. And so I talk about it as perceptual prominence. And so when, when I do an analysis, my goal is to see which notes are perceptually the most prominent so that I can phrase in a way that I'm going with our innate human perception. Um, and it, here, I, I won't go too far. I, again, how, in, if, any, if you're curious about any of this, I'm happy to talk to you more or send you my dissertation or, or things like this. But um, there's a list of rules for how to group things. Uh, so larger groups are better. So I'm not going to group two notes together. That's going to be too small to be perceptually relevant. Um, notes that are far away from each other or far in proximity, there's a boundary there. Change in register or any sort of change. So that's what that looks like. Then the, the second part, I like the fireworks, um, is uh, uh, the, the prominence part of it. So they had metrical structure. I have this prominence part of it. So you'll notice that the first rule is about pitch contour. So anything at the edge of the pitch contour, you're the highest or maybe the lowest are going to signal uh, emphasis. All right, duration of notes, loudness, accents. Accents are a great way that composers can dictate where they want there to be emphasis. Uh, so we have to listen to that. Um, and then end rule and distribution are, are from linguistics that um, emphasis tends to be either towards the beginning or towards the end of, of a group. Um, and distribution about evenly distributed in time, which doesn't apply so much to Lee's music because uh, uh, many of the sections don't have even rhythms. So this is the theory that I put together. So how, what does it look like, right? Um, 
this is just two measures from what I played for you just now, right? And uh, you'll see there's a rest in between the two measures and at the beginning and end, right? So each of those cells is one uh, group at the smallest level. And then of those notes, I went through and, and according to these rules I had set up, tested out, um, okay, which of these would be the most prominent. So for instance, that low C at the very beginning, uh, very prominent because it's longer than the notes around it and it's at the bottom of the register. So uh, going through these, these rules, and of course, um, all analysis is subjective. There's no such thing as a universal correct analysis ever. So uh, I, I operate under that understanding that this is the way that I am seeing this, the way that I am understanding it, and hoping to offer others a framework for this. Um, by the way, gesture is another word to bring up. You could say that each of these would be a little gesture, and together they're a big gesture. And I don't know if you've ever had someone say, play it just play it like a gesture, right? Um, so I, I tried to, to address some of that as well. So this is what a full analysis would look like, right? What is even happening on the page? There's too much happening. So for me, at least. And um, don't worry, we're not going to like go note by note and talk about. Um, uh, so there's a way to translate this into another form. And it's a tree diagram. So the same excerpt as a tree. Oh, this is the excerpt. Um, OK, here it starts. Now, let's, let's put it in an easier form to see what I'm talking about. So what I did is the things that had three X's have a line that goes all the way up to the top. And then the things that have two X's go up to the middle, right? And one X just go up um, part way. And uh, what I noticed is there's a lot of similarities. And if not similarities, there's a lot of things to talk about with this. So here, um, motivically, the first two big trees are, they start the same way, right? Um, and the first one, yes, is E natural, and the second one is E flat. That's just a printing error. It should be E natural, but um, it, it's not here yet uh, in, in this slide. So anyway, and we can sort of get this from what we know about motives and traditional structures and things like that. Um, I do think it's interesting if, that they all slant in the same direction and uh, anything that comes off at the middle level usually comes off to the right. So I think there's some interesting structures there. Now to show you something different that isn't just the same sort of motive, right? Uh, okay. okay. Uh, this is also DOI 3, which is the I, the piece that I used for, for my dissertation, which is why I have all these analyses already done. Um, and this is the beginning of the first cello solo. So it's in three sections separated by cello solos. And um, these structures, uh, it, let, let me play it through first, uh, just to show you how it sounds. It's very soft.
beautiful. I, I don't know, I just think that's beautiful. Um, all right. So the structures above, you know, this is con rubato, right? These rhythms aren't supposed to be exact and, and all of that, but there's a reason that he wrote in these rhythms. And there's a reason that, that we lose the time signature. And, you know, everything that's on the page is a way that the composer is communicating with us. And that's all we have, right? Short of speaking with the composer. So, um, what I tried to do was uh, was look at how that works. So, for instance, um, uh, let me see. Oh nope. Um, never mind. Well, I don't know. I for some reason can't get my annotate thing to work. Uh, so anyway, uh, that that first structure. Okay, if you get rid of the middle fork and the first line next to it is the same as the second structure. And then that second structure, if you get rid of the, the, the fourth line that's all the way on the right, it's the same as the third big tree. I, do y'all see that? So I argue that these structures are there and here um, you know you could say well in this section of the solo it's sort of uh, calming it's sort of unraveling perhaps and this structure would would show that um, it, it gives a way to talk about some things in the music and for me thinking about how to play it and thinking of this idea of gesture and what should I emphasize and and how, right? What emphasis is already built into the music so that I'm not imposing my will on something that's already there? Um, uh, it's a it's a way to to dig into that. So, uh, questions or, or comments about any of this? Brian, I had a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. You must have made some study of some of his work that actually has language in it, right? Like, um, uh, you know, there's a number of pieces, and I, I, several of them actually use more than language, more than one language at once. Like I'm thinking of Lives of the Saints, where there most of it is in English, but a large section is in Italian. Or of course, Howl, which is entirely built around a recording of Allen Ginsberg reading his poem. So I'm, I'm wondering how your system worked in that context, <laughs> or if it did, or if, or if that was just a completely different category that would apply or wouldn't apply to your system? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I purposefully have only looked at things uh, like actually applied the system to things that don't have language involved, going for a subconscious kind of connection. Um, but what I have found uh, is, and I, I've looked at how more than anything else with with words and um uh i think that using this to talk about that could show some things in the in the music and show how that music comes from the language because in that piece in particular um there are i think that one has like eight cassette tapes and he there are tapes of him reading the poem as well which are really fascinating um and yeah. uh, wilson's ivory bill also with him reading there so that i think would be cool to to take those tapes where he's reading it as well and see you know is he reading it in a different way than ginsburg is um yeah and of course i don't know, know if that answer there were there were a couple of pieces where he explored the rhythm of bird song as well and, and that's that's uh might be i don't know if that like wilson's and a piece called field guide um yeah and uh whoa applying your system to that could be cool <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and uh you know i i actually actually am supposed to be turning in the first draft of a book about this on monday but um that's another story uh and what I'm ultimately arguing is that you don't have to 
be an, a, a native English speaker for this to be working. You know, rhythms are everywhere, right? As we're walking, um, uh, birds, right? Like in nature, rhythms are everywhere, regardless of where we are in the world and what language we're speaking. Uh, and this is a way to describe how we could be perceiving them. So I don't think that it is specific to English speakers or composers who speak English. Um, I think that we could look at a French composer's, like a, a composer who only speaks French and look at that music and still describe the way that we're perceiving that music in this way, just for what that's worth. Yeah, any other questions or thoughts or comments, anything? Brian, it's fascinating. It's a lot to absorb. It's gonna, gonna be. I think it's, we're all gonna be thinking about this for a while. It's yeah, nice. it's totally fascinating. Thank you. Well, for what it's worth, I I did work on this for like four years, so it. Uh, yeah, it it can be a lot. Um, yeah, and and so like practical applications, right? Um, I think about this in so in case you don't know me I do a lot of new music uh, and and I think about this if I have a piece and I just I don't understand how to phrase it and I can't make it make sense then I sort of go back to this and and think about okay what emphasis is written in the music and what structures can I uh, latch on to um, yeah so uh, the last part and um oh why is it not i don't know it's not going to the next slide but anyway the next slide just says job so um and just briefly um i got this job at the new world school of the arts which is a college and high school program in miami uh, just undergraduate college they don't have a graduate program um, i teach cello to the high schoolers and the college students um, I teach chamber music, a ton of chamber music, actually, um, and then theory and two levels of sight singing, uh, which is funny because it's movable, uh, sorry, it's fixed dough, and I learned movable dough, and I didn't know until the day before classes started, so that was an experience. Um, and how all of this happened is I got a job offer on December 15th for this, all right? Uh, in, I took it, and in two weeks, I packed up my life in New York City where I was living. I was teaching at NYU, teaching music history and, and uh, cello lessons there. And in two weeks, just packed all that up, drove to Miami in a U-Haul uh, on New Year's Day and began classes three days later. So uh, it was a bit of a whirlwind, uh, needless to say. Um, and since then, uh, several, like my apartment flooded and, um, I, I won't go into it, but it's been quite a semester. And uh, uh, are are y'all interested in in academic jobs? By the way, <laughs> oh Scott, you have one. Uh, I'm sure many okay. people are interested. I'm interested. There we go. Yeah, cool. Um, sorry, my computer started freaking out um, as I was trying to stop the screen share. But um, yeah, so I don't know um, if it would help you to hear about what the application process was like. Uh, for me, uh, basically, uh, I've been applying for about two years to jobs um, all over everywhere. And uh, it, it started with just the good old cover letter and resume, that sort of thing. Um, then they reached out and it was a video interview. I was a finalist for a job in Ohio as well. Um, it worked the same way. So a video interview with the committee. And it's very awkward because it's very much about, we have a list of questions to ask you and we're seeing 10 other people. So can you just give us your answers so that we can be done with this and go home to our families? And uh, <laughs> so it's little, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know, in the, in the two that I had, it was a little weird like that. Um, 
because that uh, went well, then the next thing that happened was um, they had me talk to the dean and essentially just move up the leadership. So I spoke with the dean uh, twice and then I spoke with the provost who is basically the boss of the faculty. I did not know what a provost was until um, I had this job. Uh, very important person and um, uh, moved up the administration until an offer was made. And I did give a, uh, after the committee, I gave a video masterclass because it was finals week at NYU and I told them there's no way I can travel to Miami for this. Uh, so they let me do a video masterclass, um, which I guess went well. And um, eventually uh, I had to, uh, to submit. So you know how it says like list out your work history and list out your degrees. And you're like, I'm sending you my CV. Why do I need to write this, right? Uh, it's for um, uh, the actual offer. So for instance, I had not filled that in because I don't know, I didn't know that it was important. And the Dean actually called me and said, you have to send this to me in two hours. Uh, I need this now because it was an instructor position. It was listed as instructor of cello, right? But I got the offer at the assistant professor level. And um, at least at our school and, and most, you have instructor, assistant, associate, and then full. So that came with a better salary. Um, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, arguably seniority, but it's such a small music department that that doesn't really play in. And my colleagues are amazing. So uh, no one has ever pulled the seniority card on me. Uh, which is unlike several um, of my friends I have at different institutions. Um, it's not always a great environment. I've been very lucky. So I, I will be the first to say that I've been very lucky about that. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, I, I did accept the offer before ever having been to Miami uh, because I just like flying by the seat of my pants sometimes. And I really wanted an academic job because living in New York was uh, sucking my soul out of my body. Um, so I, I went for it and went down the next week, uh, uh, got a car, got an apartment and uh, had Christmas with my family and then moved. Um, the school is primarily um, uh, Latino students actually. Um, Miami has a very diverse population, a, a lot of people from Cuba and Venezuela, and that's where most of our students' um, families are from, actually. So I do speak Spanish, which was a random thing that has nothing to do with cello that helped my chances to get this job. Um, I mentioned before, I, I went for a PhD. Uh, research is not a part of what I'm doing. So everything I do is teaching. Um, I don't have to serve on graduate committees or I don't get to serve on graduate committees because I would love to do that, uh, nerd, remember? But um, every part of my contract is teaching 100%. So it means that I teach an insane amount. I have office hour, you know, I start my office hours at seven in the morning um, and then finish around four or five each day. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. It, <laughs> well, it's it's either that or, or stay late. And like students aren't around that early. So then I can get some practicing done and um, it's quiet in the building, which is nice. Uh, let's see what else to say. Um, yeah, I'd say the, the biggest thing is I was surprised that they offered me a higher level, like the offer was better than what the job posting was. Uh, so there was no room to negotiate uh, and salary negotiation is a big part of what people will tell you about jobs. Uh, the dean called me up and said, um, uh, this is what it is, uh, take it or leave it. And I said, well, can you just go? And he cut me off and said, no, it's really you ha just yes or no is what I need from you. Uh, and I don't know, it, on the personal side, I had worked out with, with my partner um, what, what it would needed to be 
uh, what the salary needed to be for it to be worth it for me and for her to move from New York. Um, and it was. Uh, luckily, we uh, I reached that threshold. Um, it's, you know, and as with any new thing, a ton of new processes, there are new systems, you know, they use all the Microsoft stuff, whereas at NYU, they used all the Google apps. So in the midst of transitioning to that and like, um, I've never had a salary ever in my life. Uh, everything has been hourly or uh, gig wise. And um, that's part of why I personally have been pushing so hard um, for me is uh, uh, for my own uh, comfort of mind. Um, I don't play as much as I was. Uh, I will get to next semester and I won't go into the details of this, but we don't have summer classes, but the way that my contract works, I have to teach during the summer. So I have to build up extra points, extra teaching points that then, so during the spring and the fall, um, I teach extra that then goes to cover my summer because no classes are actually offered. Um, and so it's particularly crazy because normally you split that summer out over spring, your fall and your spring. But because I joined for spring semester, I had to do all of it in the spring, which was a lot. Yeah. Um, so uh, let, let's see. I think that kind of, do, do y'all have questions about anything? What was Sorry, your, yeah. you mentioned that you worked at NY, NYU. So what was mm -hmm. your previous work and experience? What do you, what do you had a resume? It's a good question. Uh, so in my master's at the Boston Conservatory, uh, I was a teaching assistant in music history and I did that for two years. Uh, then let's see, I'm trying to think what else I, I didn't really do much before my master's teaching wise. And uh, yeah, sorry, at Berkeley, yeah. <laughs> Although not when I was there, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, let's see, I had a private studio in Boston um, and I gigged a lot. Um, and then, let's see, I think that was, oh, uh, I, I did, I, I taught some sectionals at um, uh, Community Music Center, Boston, CMCB, and did some subbing for teaching in, in that way. I didn't actually have a, a, a real straight teaching gig, uh, mainly just private studio. Uh, I also taught test prep. And anyone who's looking for a second job, I still do it. Um, it is amazing. I teach for ten, Princeton Review online. Um, you can set your schedule. Uh, you can teach as much or as little as you want. So in the summer, I do more. Uh, I've been doing that off and on for like nine or 10 years now. Um, great gig. Do Princeton Review, don't do Kaplan, um, just for what it matters. SAT and GRE, that's what I've been doing. Um, for Princeton Review, you just have to take a little test and, and see if you qualify. You don't actually have to submit an official score, I believe. Um, so that's a big part of how I supplemented my income, if that helps. Um, then I got to New York and uh, do we, any of y'all live in New York? Okay. I do. Okay, cool. Um, it, it is a hard place to live. Extremely. Um, what'd you say? Extremely. Yes, <laughs> you understand. <laughs> yeah. um, the cost of living is so high. Um, the scene is very hard to get into. Uh, Boston people really hold on to their gigs. In New York, it's even more so. And um, uh, there's not like a New York scene. There's the New York like classical symphony. Uh, scene. There's the New York like classical chain, like there's so many different pockets. And so to gig there, you kind of have to go for one thing and just do that one thing. Um, I don't like just doing one thing. So it did not uh, work with my lifestyle very well or, or my job satisfaction, I should say. Um, it's really hard to, to get in and sub places. Uh, so 
I, uh, while I was at NYU, part of it was teaching as an adjunct. And um, I taught cello lessons and I tutored music theory. So I, I tried to kind of dip my toe into the different areas, um, hoping that I would find some small school in the middle of nowhere that needed a cello teacher and a theory teacher and that I could help them out with that with something on my resume. Um, and yeah, that school in, in Ohio was like that, but we just like massively did not get along. And they flew me out for a campus visit and it was super awkward, um, but that's fine. Um, and they gave the job to someone who like has been teaching um, uh, classroom orchestra. So they didn't really want like a main cell. Weird story. Jobs are weird. Uh, yeah, Scott, I see you're waving at me. I just, uh, 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 you, you came from the big city. I guess once upon a time I did too. So I want to make a case for going to the middle of nowhere because in comparison to Boston and New York, you are in the middle of nowhere in yes. Miami. You know, and but uh, to all of you who are considering, you know, one of the things if you apply for a teaching job, please don't be afraid of going to the, the middle of nowhere and staying there for a while, because uh, um, although I do get lonely in certain ways, sometimes living in the middle of nowhere over time, you can do so much of the literature you build, you have you, eventually students come through your ken. I mean, I'm looking at all these people, it's overwhelming. I mean, Nick, Amanda, uh, Byron, um, you, you, uh, Jen, you know, uh, and the, the list goes on, who are out doing stuff. And then you realize that, you know, in taking a position that is not in the big Boston or Chicago or New York, that, um, that there's really a, a, another sort of dimension to it. And uh, so I'll stop with my spiel, except to say that uh, when we open up again, Brian, I want you, if you would, come over and play Hyla for us at USF. Absolutely. Only if you come to, come to New World. <laughs> okay, deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and well, and, oh, sorry, go ahead, Judy. Oh, oh no, I was just gonna say like, in a, like speaking to that, the Dean of our school is also the concert master of the Miami Symphony. So because it's a smaller scene, um, in some ways, you, there's a lot more that you can do. Bingo. And so, yeah. So, um, I mean, for instance, uh, if it, there's no way it's going to happen, but like in October, I'm set to play Beethoven triple with him and the pianist on faculty because, you know, now I'm at that school and that school has clout in the community because it's a smaller community. So um, yeah, I would 100% echo that, Scott, that, uh, yeah, and whatever the application is, just send it. Even if you don't wanna live there, send the application. I would not have done well in these interviews if I hadn't had that super awkward Ohio experience. I'm very confident about. I just, I just wanted to say something. Also, I also live in the world of colleges for like another three weeks. Um, and um, I, you know, like Scott, um, uh, I, I've been on search committees and it's, I, I just want to say to everybody, I think when, when people are, are looking to hire someone, they really are paying attention to your application and they're really reading for who you are and they're looking for colleagues, you know, they're looking for company. And um, whether it's a good fit or a bad fit for you, um, just I think you can trust that there's always going to be somebody who's really like really looking closely at your material. Because I was on a number of search committees, not always for performers, but for historians and other other positions and uh, conducting. You know, uh, well, I guess that's performing. <laughs> but uh, I just I think it it. It's a really ungainly process. I think academia is bizarre, but you know, it's just inhabited by a lot of people who are trying to like, you know, do what they love to do somehow. So, you know, go for it and and don't be afraid to write things about your your re real self because it really does stand out. Yeah, I've noticed I've for 30 years now I, I don't know how many search committees I've been on, and uh, most often as chair. 
And uh, I can tell you that committees are really looking. Uh, we are looking for people hot off the press. And the one ticket, the pass go thing is college teaching experience. If you've had a graduate teaching assistantship, um, that's your college teaching experience. And that's the one of the first things they, uh, we check off the list. We, it, 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 there has to be some kind of presence there most often, uh, uh, unless you're applying to Harvard or something where the, they're looking for something different. But um, so it sounds like a lot of you have this experience, so it counts. Does it really matter what exactly you're doing as a graduate assistant? Graduate I'll, tell, I'll tell you my story. I was, I was a, an assistant at Juilliard and I, was, I taught new, uh, ear training, solfege. And it's actually was, not bad, but I'm, I, I'm, for example, I, I'm listed as a teaching, a graduate teaching assistant, but what I'm doing, I'm working with the kids from underprivileged areas, which what has nothing to do with the, uh, teaching at the university. Um, Did they break Edward, up? Can I? Yeah, no, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about that, Edward. You still could get a pass go, but Edward, you were my teaching assistant at USF. Yes, and I did so much teaching. <laughs> you you ran a community. It was all possible because of you. So you you have sure. that. That counts. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. I I wanted to speak to that too. That. Um, uh, you know, sometimes even if you aren't given the opportunity to get the experience that you want in your assistantship, wherever you might be, um, if you do land some kind of connection with a school, even if it's just as, um, you know, a, 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 an adjunct instructor of some kind, you know, um, your willingness to do what others may not want to do, like teach music theory or teach music history is really, really important. And you can quickly make yourself indispensable um, because oftentimes the departments, partly what they're looking for is personnel who will solve their sometimes very, very serious problems. And I, I don't know, kind of adding on to that, um, I talked to my friends who were doing that and asked about giving guest presentations. And just to start getting some sort of teaching, you know, if you know a composer on a faculty at a school, ask if you can come do a reading, um, anything to get that sort of thing on the resume. Um, I also did a lot of conferences, tons of conference presentations, and uh, that was really useful because that got me traveling around and, and networking and yeah, just to kind of add on to that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I will say, which has been interesting and um, maybe should be expected, but I'm a, I'm a good, I don't know, 20 to 30 years younger than everyone on the faculty. And um, uh, I think everyone has made some comment about me being young, uh, students included, uh, which I wasn't, I wasn't prepared that uh, so many people would say something about that. But um, I'm lucky because they see that as an asset. And so they will ask me to come up with some different idea. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say to, to this point is, and I don't know what y'all can speak to, but I talked a ton about recruiting in my interview. And uh, since being on the faculty, we have talked a ton about recruiting. So uh, that might be something to, to think about how you would speak about. Brian, Brian do you take trips? to do it? Uh, I would have if pandemic didn't right. happen. Okay, right. Yeah. But, but, that's, but that's part of the plan is to do recruiting trips, right? Right, right. Uh, and we are actually getting a new, our conductor is retiring after 23 years. Um, he was 80, 
82, 83. Uh, so bringing me on, and I, I'm the first full-time cello that they've had in 20 years. So we're about to get a conductor slash violin, meaning we'll have a full string complement on faculty, which is uh, huge for the school. So next year, uh, we're actually planning to do a lot of trips with whoever this new person is going to be. Brian, could I jump in for a minute? This, uh, this is important for everybody just because recruiting is the first thing they are going to ask, um, uh, ask about. And uh, uh, make it centered on your playing and bring them to campus so that uh, as part of your strategy that you talk about with your search committee, about bringing people, students to campus for a cello day, a, you know, this sort of thing, so they, that they are coming. That, that's something you want to, everybody would want to keep in mind uh, when that question comes. And maybe in involving, mentioning to involve adjuncts in that, so that the students are not just meeting you, but they're meeting all the instruments. So all of our winds and brass and percussion are adjuncts. Mm -hmm. So recruiting is tricky for those instruments. And I am not the best recruiter for trombone. Uh, so uh, just another thing that you could mention um, that's I have found people were really interested in is how to involve adjuncts in that. Brian, this has been great. It's been really, Good. really um, multifaceted presentation. Um, you know, I, so I know we've been talking a lot about academic jobs, but I just wanted to bring up something that that I've seen change over my career is that nowadays there are so many different ways you can make a living in the arts, and I find that so heartening and exciting that it you no longer have to have an academic job. Although they're, you know, they're fabulous, and if you love teaching, which obviously you do, it's great, you know. But there are so many ways to be in the profession out there that it's just, it's mind-boggling now. For sure. And we're coming, we're coming up with new ways of being in the profession. It seems like every year there's something new. Definitely. And, Nick, are you uh, crazy, Yeah. Hi. Um, so, um, because I wasn't sure if I was coming back to Boco, I had like a series of three weeks, which is still kind of continuing on, where I was like, shit, I, I have to plan my life. Um, <laughs> and I have to think about like how the things I'm going to do make money. Um, so I, I was going to ask Jen this earlier because it was like a big question mark all of, over all of those things. Like, how do you make game, my, game night make money? How do you make sure you can survive on game night or things like game not, night? Um, and I realized that that is not what this presentation is um, but um, do you like quick suggestions like how like how you budgeted how you estimated living costs or how much money a particular thing is gonna make um is my mic working oh, okay good because I smacked it earlier I think I got it fixed okay um okay I have kind of to a two-part answer to this. One is you're going to need to find funding partnerships. So for example, game night, we didn't just like throw a party by ourselves, which would have been fun, but would have cost us a lot of money. So we partnered with Synchrome, which is a presenting arts organization, and Boston Court Pasadena, which is another presenting arts organization. So they don't create content, they provide spaces for content, and I would be the content creator in that um, kind of configuration. So um, they're the ones who provide the money for that. Another option is to get a fiscal sponsorship. There are these things called umbrella um, uh, nonprofits. Um, getting a, your own nonprofit status can give you access to a lot of money, but it's also like an administrative nightmare. So what you can do is find these uh, umbrella organizations. A very popular one is Fractured Atlas, where they will sponsor you and be your 501c3 status which gives you access to tons of grants um, and other funding opportunities there. The arts world is, uh, the arts performance world is largely funded by donors and grants. Ticket sales, 90% of the time is not gonna cut it. 
So um, you can, over time, I don't really know how to do this yet. It's something I've been working on, like finding a, a family of rich people to help you pay for your stuff. <laughs> Um, but then also getting really comfortable with grant applications, finding them, applying for them. Um, and then the second part of that answer um, is something I've worked really hard at as a freelancer is to stabilize my income. Um, so what I do is I, um, I have two very important bank accounts in my life that are completely separate from my family. They're just like my cello accounts. One is my income and one is my savings. So every dollar I make from the cello goes into my income account. And then uh, I have a monthly transfer of a salary from that account into like my family income. Right. So what that does is like stabilizes the ebb and flow. So if I make $3,000 one month and $400 over the summer when there's like no work anymore, I'm still like collecting my salary because I'm not just like grabbing the $3,000 when it comes and spending it all and like having nothing over the summer. So, um, so everything goes in that one account and I draw a salary from it. And then the emergency fund is something that over time when I like start to make more than my salary, I squirrel it away into my emergency fund. So for if, um, if I have something terrible happen to me, like I break my arm, I can transfer my emergency money over to my regular account and still collect my salary. When I had a baby, I gave myself a paid maternity leave out of my emergency fund. Now that, that pin, this pandemic has decimated performing, I'm, I'm drawing from my emergency fund. So I'm not like living paycheck to paycheck in a way. Like it's really like a shell game. I'm just like shuffling and squirreling money around, but like it helps some of the insecurity of the freelance life go away. Um, that's a strategy that's really worked well for me. And that was really directed at anyone, if anyone had any suggestions. But yes, thank you so much. Yeah. Didn't Great. Work. So I think we we probably should could should call it a break right now because we've got a class, we've got a master class tonight. Everyone's playing. Five people are playing. Six people are playing. Anyway. Brian, thank you so much. This has been great. And Jen, thank you Thanks for, for earlier. Me. Both you guys, amazing. <laughs> Bye, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you.